investigations, the depths of his investigations into various uh, areas that link technology with agriculture. And uh, so I decided, and I don't know if you, if anybody ever reads these things, but I put, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I put them out uh, every time we have a seminar speaker. So I decided to take a slightly different uh, tack this time. Uh, but first, let me introduce Jung Yo Yun. Close Very enough? Precise. No, it's not. It's <laughs> Thank perfect. You. Thank you. I was practicing <laughs> before. Um, and uh, the first thing that uh, I came across was to say in very few words what uh, Professor Yoon is all about. So uh, I decided to do the numbers game. So two is the number of PhDs earned. I don't know of too many people who have two PhDs. He does. <laughs> um, then he has uh, uh, four areas where he has significant contributions in research uh, to the linkage, as I said, between technology, plant uh, health and disease, and various other things. Uh, then six, number six, is the number of University of Arizona titles he's holding. And fortunately, they're all up there, so you can read them. Actually, there is one missing. There is one missing. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's number six. Because I was not sure whether I still have that title. <laughs> uh, then um, number eight is uh, the number of uh, courses he has been teaching over the years, both graduate and undergraduate. Uh, 23 is the number of uh, book chapters and books that he has written. He has trained also 23 postdocs and graduate students, and he has published 89 papers in peer-reviewed uh, journals. And he can tell you a little bit, perhaps, about um, the difficulty of getting into some of these journals because they uh, have very different attitudes about the marriage of academic research and the commercial sector but I'll let him tell you about that. The title you can read on the board, and here is Professor Yun. Thank you for accepting our invitation, by the way. And thank you very much for your invitation, and thank you very much for the nice introduction. Can you hear me okay? Microphone? Okay, so um, I do work on the biosensor, and um, what I mean biosensor, I do work on biosensor from A to Z, so can be used for water quality, food safety, and um, you know the microbiology, medical diagnostics, basically, or, or environmental monitoring. But the one that I've actually um, missed in the past couple of years is actually about the plants. So um, I'm not going to showcase my whole work in my laboratory for the past 15 years. I joined U of A in 2004, so this actually marks the 15th year, and. Um, the, today's talk will be focused more on use of the smartphone towards the detection of the plant health and diseases. So that will be the main theme of our talk today. So this is the diagram I draw using my PowerPoint. So it's not an Adobe Illustrator, so it's not really fancy. But um, you can actually see what's in there. So I just, um, I wanted to take a photograph of the um, either iPhone 10 or the Galaxy S10 or something. And um, you know, the, actually, this is actually for my book, the new book, which will come out in October this year. And they didn't really like it. <laughs> so I needed to actually draw from the scratch. And this is what I got. And um, there are a lot of sensors there, as you can see. You may think only the camera as your optical imaging sensor, but there are other things like um, ambient light sensor, so you can adjust your screen light, backlight. And um, some good ones, they have an IR camera or the IR sensor. And also they have a proximity sensor primarily. Have you noticed that when you actually speak with your phone and then put it on your ear, then it actually automatically turns off? That's the proximity sensor. And um, 
It has front and rear camera. And um, they, have a, they also have a white LED flash. And they have GPS, accelerometer, gyroscope. And um, they have a microphone, which is also important in accepting analog signal. Unfortunately, in the newer phones, they have eliminated. So have you seen that the, um, when you actually use your credit card in your taxi cab, they actually plug something in your microphone? That's actually the analog thing, OK? Um, but nowadays, they have to convert it back to the, um, you know, the U micro USB, which is digital. We'll talk about that later. Since the smartphone has all those the, um, sensors, why don't we actually use it for many different sensing and biosensing applications? So that's the um, motivation of this research. So I'm going to give you, showcase a little bit of what we have done in our lab in the past, how we have utilized smartphone towards the um, biosensing. So the one of the very first attempt, and some of you may already have seen this because this was published in 2013. So there was, it's already like six years old technology uh, from the viewpoint of our lab. So this is obviously iPhone 4 at the time. So you can see how small the phone is at those days. Um, and that's the letter of flow assay. And a good example would be the pregnancy test. And in the pregnancy test, you are detecting really high concentration. And it's yes or no, whether you are pregnant or you're pregnant or not pregnant. Whereas this kit is designed for monitoring thyroid stimulating hormone from your blood sample. For those ones, yes or no is not enough. You need to know the exact concentration. You need to quantify them. And then the lateral flow assay is out there to make your assay you know, done in a handheld manner at your home or maybe at the patient care. But you need to, how are you going to quantify it? And actually for this kit, there is a reflectometer that will read the band intensity. And the kit itself, you know, each strip, they sell it like 20, 30 bucks which is a little more expensive than pregnancy test, but that's affordable. Refractometer, um, their price tag is like a 20K, which is, easy, which is actually a spectrophotometer. So what's the point? It's actually about this big, and it's no longer handheld. So when the, um, the doctor actually um, in, the, um, in the, so some of the, some doctor actually approached me, hey, Dr. Yun, can you actually make a reader device for this one? I think I can use my smartphone. So that's why I actually came up with this. So there is a small cassette uh, that can be inserted in your smartphone and utilizing your smartphone's LED as your light source. And then the camera as our detector. And then we got an app to uh, quantify the concentration. We did a little bit of tweak in our optical detection system. And then we also improved our detection limit by one order of magnitude, which is 10 times compared to the commercial reflectometer. Because you are actually using the um, little bit of light scattering technology, which they didn't. So it worked really great. And then simple idea. And then we got a presentation at the Biosensors World Congress. And then there are a lot of people out there. And then um, there was a lot of follow-up research after this. Actually, to me, it feels like yesterday, but it's already like six years before things. Then since I'm the lab on a chip guy, so I naturally wanted to duplicate this technology on the lab on a chip. Lab on a chip is essentially a silicon chip using the same technology made for the semiconductor chip. And then what happens is your sample will be incubated, mixed, and separated in a microfluidic channel so that you don't really have to do pipetting or the centrifuging or the liquid transfer. Again, I can insert my lab on a chip into this smartphone attachment and then guide my white LED light flash and um, camera into the waveguide system so it can actually irradiate the system uh, whatever we want. Actually, during the uh, Biosensor World Congress, uh, some of the audience raised his hand and uh, basically, I don't want to use that attachment thing. Can you just use the phone as it is? And then the lab on a chip sounds a little complicated. Can you actually make it cheaper? So that's what he got. 
we converted our lab on a chip into the paper. We just created this pattern using commercial wax printer. Uh, reagents are preloaded and dried before use, just like the um, pregnancy test. And um, you're going to dip our this, uh, the, the paper microfluidic chip, the waste one sample, and then measure the concentration of E. coli or salmonella. Is um, positioned at a certain optimized distance and angle, and then make our detection through the uh, image processing algorithm. We can fi finally concentrate, uh, quantify the concentrations of the target in our sample. This was published in 2015, so about four years, um, you know, the before today. Then we moved on to not just E. coli, but why don't we actually quantify the concentrations of other stuff like heavy metals, chlorine, caffeine from the drinking water or the wastewater system? So it has a multiple channel and uh, image the, um, the, the compensation and optimization system. And recently, uh, we are not actually reading the light intensity from the chip, but we are more interested in um, measuring the flow behavior that can be related to the target composition or the makeup or the concentration of your sample. Okay, so this is ongoing research. That's a little bit of background, and um, some of you may already heard that the um, the I just um, you know they made a presentation at the ACS American Chemical Society conference, and um, which was actually the the press release. And this is the video. Actually, the first author of this manuscript is actually here. Su Jung, raise your hand. So he's actually the real star. He really needs to actually make this presentation today because um, the follow work on the plant health uh, monitoring is also done by Sue. So he's the real star. But I'm going to show this video quickly. So this is about the norovirus from wastewater sample. That's the commercial. Microscope attachment you can buy from Amazon, $30. In the 3D printed enclosure and LED and light source. The reaction is already happening. This is real time. Insert it. Take a photo. And then turn on the MATLAB, the mobile app, which will count um, the, the number of norovirus particles in your sample. And it's actually, the beauty of this system is that it is extremely accurate. You can count almost at the single virus copy level. If you do not know what that really means, uh, in terms of the mass, it's an atogram scale, 10 to the negative 18. It's not femto, it's not pico or nano, it is an atogram scale, which is close to the single virus copy level. So that's what we got. So we got a lot of beyond the detection going on with our smartphone system. We can also monitor the um, extent of your blood coagulation. And this is quite important um, because when you do the open heart surgery, your blood will be bypassed through the um, so-called heart lung machine. And since they are made out of the synthetic material, your blood will coagulate. So they actually add anticoagulant. You don't want to put too much. You don't want to put too less. So how do we monitor the extent of blood coagulation? You have to do it in real time. What they do, they actually have a device to monitor coagulation level, but each assay takes about 10, 15 minutes. They call it as real time. And then during that assay, all the surgeons and the assistants, they're just sitting there and doing nothing. <laughs> so why don't you create a smartphone-based system on the paper microfluidic device, which will tell you the extent of coagulation in response to, in this case, eight different uh, anticoagulant concentration, so it can actually optimize the, um, uh, the, the actual appropriate dose for, your, for the patient. So this is actually done uh, in collaboration with the um, perfusion science program here at the Urbane. And um, we can also use our smartphone, and this is the um, so-called organ on a chip, where the, um, the human cells are cultured in lab on a chip. 
So we actually create an organ mimic. Okay, and then we can do lots of different things. Um, the downside is that whoever using organ in a chip, they use microscope, benchtop microscope to monitor the assay. In our case, we are using a microscope, which actually works, and um, it, um, then we can actually make the, um, the entire platform really small and affordable. Now, the real main story today, again, the, um, this work was also first authored by Sue, which is right here. And actually, the, the co-author, Lane, is also here. Can you raise your hand? Yeah, she was the um, assistant to Sue as an undergrad. Now she's in the PhD program here at the OVA. So um, the Sue was interested. She, Sue actually had um, you know the the ag engineering background, and um, even though he was interested in waterborne detecting waterborne pathogens, but he really wanted to use our smartphone technology towards plants and crops. So. Um, and we actually dig up some literature and what's actually available out there. And then most of them actually uses the um, IR or NIR camera. And then um, the, I know that every single smartphone actually has an IR block filter, basically eliminates all NIR or IR. So the smartphones are useless. And then we accidentally found that the newer versions of the smartphone starting from iPhone 8 and Galaxy, is it S8 or S9? So starting from S8, we found that they eliminated IR block filter. I don't know the reason why. Maybe they just found that you know, the, um, it's going to be cheaper that way. So to save the cost, even though they are keep raising their price. And uh, it may be also related to the facial recognition feature. Well, we, we have no idea how, why they did that and how they are doing that because that's the commercial secret. But we do know that there's no, no longer IR block filter. Smartphone cannot see real IR, but they can see neo-infrared and IR, which is very important because um, you know, the, in the, the monitoring plant health, you really need to monitor the um, NIR intensity as a reference and then the red intensity as your rear signal. And if you normalize them, then you will actually get an index called the um, DVI, normalized different um, vegetation index, which is the um, NIR intensity minus the red intensity divided by NIR intensity plus the red intensity. That indicates the overall health of your plant leaves. You may think, can I just measure red? No, you cannot do that because um, the lighting is different. Each leaves are different, and then their pigments are different. So you need a reference. The only reference you can count on is actually NIR. Actually, this is very similar to pulse oximeter. When you go to hospital, when you actually lie in your bed, the first thing you do, they're just gonna give you something clipping on your finger, right? And you may think it measures pulse, but it actually measures something else. It's a pulse oximeter. It measures blood oxygen saturation level. It actually measures the spectrum, actually not spectrum, but the, uh, how much hemoglobin in your blood are actually oxygenated. They actually measure the same thing. They have two you know, the detectors. One is the red detector. The other is the NIR detector. It actually gives you the overall health of your body. Sounds very familiar, isn't it? Plants actually NDBI, and then uh, the, the oximeter for your blood, uh, for your human body, we're talking about essentially the same stuff. And actually, if you look at the hemoglobin spectrum and chlorophyll spectrum, they are surprisingly similar. And that may be the, the common relationship between the plants and animals. So now we know that your smartphone can recognize NIR, we just found by accident, and then we just quickly reviewed all the literature, no papers found. All right, so this is our golden opportunity. Let's get the paper out, and then let's do it quickly. The problem is your smartphone is not able to recognize NIR as NIR. It just still recognize part of your red. So you really need um, band pass, high pass filter, and then measure it, then you only measure NIR in the red intensity region. 
then you eliminate it, then measure, then it's your red intensity value. So you just take two different images with and without filter. How did I attach to it? I think we just taped it, right? <laughs> it's not a lens, it's just a filter. So the, um, once they are sitting on top of your camera, it works. And how much was the NIR and high filter? It was rather expensive. $70, we call it expensive. <laughs> well, in the biological world, $70 is nothing. Any kit, whatever biological assay kit, 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks is really easy. Instrumentation, few tens of thousand dollars. Smartphone, everybody has it. All I need to buy, I don't need a lab on a chip or a paper chip. I don't need any reagent. All I need is $70 high path filter and you can actually make it jump, uh, make it walk. So we got a lot of images, and then these are the, um, the without filter and with filter images. And then um, we just used the one phone, and then um, you know, the, I think the reviewers didn't really like us. Did you really test it, all the phones available out there? Okay, so what he did, um, we just, okay, what phone do you have? I just surveyed all of my graduate students and undergraduate students, and then we collected all of them. <laughs> and these are our collections. So at the time, Galaxy S8, S7, Nexus 5X, iPhone 8, iPhone 7, iPhone SE, 6S, well, mostly iPhone. <laughs> some of them, this is the IR LED. Some of them you can see, some of them you cannot see. And um, we got the best data with the Galaxy phones. Galaxy S7 or S8, and those are the ones that we decided to use. I think we use S8, right? Because on the S7, we got some issues with our images, and S8 actually gives you much clearer images. And it makes sense because it's a better camera. And um, we created a series of the chlorophyll solution, and then created the standard curve. So the y-axis is NDVI, x-axis is chlorophyll A concentration. Then the curve was really linear with the r scale value really great. Remember, this is still data collected from smartphone. And um, those three, um, you know, the plants, well, the Sue actually just um, went outside and then looked at the, um, the plants um, nearby the, um, the Mali building and then collected those three. And then, you know, the U of A actually has a nice website and then which tree is which, and they have a database. So that's how we actually figured out which one is which. And um, we actually, they assayed the chlorophyll concentration in a conventional manner. So we actually grounded all the leaves, extracted chlorophyll, and then measured the spectroscopic measure, and then plotted against the um, NDVI, and then it shows a really nice linear relationship. Some plants are really good shape and some plants are really in bad shape. So we intentionally collected those two. And then we also related to NDVI towards the, um, the water content. Well, the water content is easy to measure. You know, they take it and then, and then actually they measure the weight and then put it into the oven, dry them and measure the weight. And um, you can clearly see that um, the, your NDVI is going up as you increase your vegetation water content. And as and then once you actually hit like a 40% or something, then it becomes saturated. But it's not exactly linearly proportional because your plant health is not a, not a function just of the water stress. It, there are many other factors involved. So that's why you actually see more scattering. But that's okay, it is expected. So, um, so we actually got a really great data. And um, so that work has been published in the Computers and Electronics in Agriculture. And it um, looks like the editor really liked our work, whereas the, um, the reviewers has been a little bit more critical. But the editor has been very supportive somehow. And um, so now we actually get this job done, then we need to do a little bit more than that. So that's the next phase of our project, um, which is actually currently led by Katika, who's also here, raise your hand. <laughs> now actually taking a lead and Sue is also participating on this project. Um, we are particularly interested in 
paper mild model virus or PMMOV. Um, everybody actually heard about it, what that is? It doesn't kill you, it doesn't affect you, but it affects the, um, the pepper tree, okay? And um, actually, when you actually eat ketchup, you most likely have it. And they don't actually regulate it because it doesn't actually affect any impact on human. But most likely, you're gonna have this in some of your ketchup bottles. And um, this is actually considered as an indicator for wastewater treatment. When you have more PMMOV, then most likely you're gonna have more problems in your wastewater sample. So what they plan to do is that the, um, in, the, in every single wastewater treatment facility, you're gonna have this tree. So there is a hydroponic system, okay? And then these trees are actually being grown all the time in the water treatment facility. And then you're gonna actually monitor the PMMOSV infection, and then may indicate, they may serve as an indicator for the, uh, the water treatment, the potential introduction of the virus or bacteria. That's the concept. So sounds interesting, but do you know how they actually do that? They take the leaves out and then grind them, extract the genetic material, and then run through the PCR, polymerase chain reaction. This is not a great idea. So how do we actually know whether your uh, the pepper plants are actually infected by the virus particles? And of course, when you actually have a virus infection, then your NDVI will be compromised. But we don't know whether it's coming from water stress or from the actual virus infection. And of course, if you have a hydroponic system, you're gonna have plenty of water supply, but we don't really know whether it's coming from other you know, the factors. Um, the other method is actually the chlorophyll meter. So we actually measure the chlorophyll content. But actually, you know what? We can do exactly the same thing using our smartphone system. So we can easily replace this. But again, this is not that specific compared to PCR. Third method is the imaging sensor, which is actually quite important because when you actually have virus infection, you actually have yellow spots here and there. And then the spots usually have a certain pattern. And uh, maybe you can actually use that pattern as an indicator for a virus infection. And then people are actually doing that again using camera and then uh, you can use visible, but you actually need an NIR as a reference. So again, why not using smartphone? So we have some preliminary data to share with you. And um, so we got these images of your, you know, the, um, you know, the, the pepper tree, pepper leaves. And then the one in the left uh, is actually the NIR image. And um, using our image analysis algorithm, we can find out the distribution of the pixels. And you can clearly see that in um, non, this is red images, you know, the uh, pixel intensities, they may be shifted to the left or right, but they are most likely, you know, the kind of um, the single peaks showing up. And then so is the NI images. And these are the all healthy leaves. Then we infected, um, you applied one copy of PMMOSV to the pepper tree leaves, and then we actually got this histogram analysis. Um, uh, some of them are pretty much the same because the one copy is really low number, so some plants may actually pick that up and some plants maybe not. But some of them, I can clearly see I have um, two peaks or three peaks. And those are the ones potentially infected by the viruses. When I put, when we put six to the 10 to the six copies, which is a big number, every single leaf shows multiple peaks. And if you actually look at the leaves at that point, you see spots here and there. And then our next job is to use this histogram feed in into the uh, machine learning database. And then we're gonna train the model. This is the real virus infection. And these are, no, this is something else. And then the case by case, when you have a huge number of the database, 
then the, the prediction accuracy will be improved. We are not there yet. But I think you know, the, we have a capability of showing all this data. And um, this is the, and obviously we need to convert our sample, the, compare our data with the actual PCR data, which is the gold standard right now. That's for, for the RTQ-PCR. And these are the actual, the RTQ-PCR assay for all the plant seeds. And then right now the data is not really convincing because, um, but mainly because applying 10 to the 6 copy does not automatically guarantee high level of infection. Some plant leaves can take it and some others maybe not. And because of that, you may actually get different response. So um, I think it's just a matter of collecting large number of sample data at this time and then feed in our machine learning algorithm. So we have a lot of the uh, machine learning tools that we can use. Um, the easiest one will be PCA, principal component analysis. But um, one is becoming more common these days are actually TSNE. Um, or the um, LDA, linear discriminant analysis, or the support vector machines, linear versus nonlinear, and so on. Um, there is an interesting article published in Science last year. Um, they actually suggested you're just going to grow your plants at your home, and then your plants is already, um, you know, the genetically modified. When the uh, when the, um, the mold actually invades the, um, you know, the mold is actually being picked up by your plants. And then uh, the promoter region, it's a synthetic biology, the promoter re region will be activated and they start um, producing yellow, actually it's not yellow, orange fluorescent protein or OFP. And then your fluorescence protein is being produced within the plant and then use your smartphone to modify your fluorescence. So you just irradiate with green, and then we have a, you know, the, there is a filter to pick up just the orange color. So it's just a matter of just scan your plant, and then when you see the orange color, you have more time to change your air conditioner filter. Okay. And um, the, I think it's gonna be a commercial kit. And then that's why they actually, they just suggested this idea, but they actually never have any data. But the science actually picked it up. It's an interesting story. Sometimes, um, you know, when you actually read the science article, you know, the, um, something that has no data or there's something that has, makes absolutely no sense, they just accept it. And sometimes um, they reject the paper, which actually eventually won a Nobel Prize, like PCR, for example. <laughs> anyway. That's an interesting story that we really want to actually follow up with. And um, I actually had um, the fun discussion with Barry Pryor about two weeks ago. I just uh, bumped up with him because, you know, the Barry Pryor used to be in the same level in my office. He was in the fifth floor. I was in the fifth floor. We chatted a lot. And recently he moved down to the third floor. And then we kind of missed him. And um, well, actually we served on the graduation committee, many, many different graduation the master's and PhD dissertation committees. I just met him at the, um, the Sixth Street garage. And then we started chatting. So we just stood there about half an hour. And then it was like one of seven. <laughs> and then we were kind of sweating. And then, but we got excited. And then he actually mentioned about, um, you know, the, the NASA people may be interested in um, using this kind of um, you know, the imaging-based technology to be used in the spaceship, especially when you want to colonize Moon or Mars. Because um, they do not want, right now, the methods out there, it's something that requires some um, liquid handling. And um, astronauts are really, really concerned about using those kind of pipetting things. What if we actually have a plant, you know, the genetically modified already? then they need to grow plant anyway in that, you know, the um, Luna or the Mars greenhouses. And some of them will be indicator plants and then used to monitor the environment, human and crop environment, both of them. And then maybe they can pick up this idea. I heard that the, um, the NASA is actually, I actually heard a lot of groomy stories about the USDA and, you know, the, the DOD, uh, I think the USDA and what is it? 
But um, you know, NASA is actually not actually being hard to hit very hard. They, they do have funding right now, so we may have an opportunity to go for that. Um, that's the photo taken um, in the spring semester. So the makeup of our lab will be quite different this, this semester because a lot of students have graduated and a lot of new guys will join us. So this is actually outdated photo, but we have not yet taken new photo yet, so I have to use this one. I'm just showing a couple of other photographs um, showing our activity. So these are our optical scanner device for identifying cancer or the um, wound infection. This is the, um, another device that we developed to identify oil spill from the seawater. That's actually the big project going on in our lab. And spectrometer device that are identified the organic molecules. Again, it can be used for oil spill, but can be used for any other detection of the, any other chemicals in the wastewater. I'm gonna skip this. And um, some of you may already have seen this. This is our, this is our PCR device um, that actually makes our PCR hand there then extremely fast and extremely sensitive. So that should be it. So if you have any questions, then I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow, that's what I call cool science. Amazing. I, I want to ask the first question because I have the microphone. Uh, <laughs> when you were talking about detection of viruses and plant leaves, uh, the detection is DNA specific so that you can distinguish between two different viruses, for example? With PCR, yes. With our technology, no. However, I believe we can make a distinction between real virus infection versus the, um, it's just a simple stress or maybe something else. But because the, um, the, the pattern, you know, the experienced uh, the botanist can actually tell the difference simply by looking at the leaves. And then remember that um, the beauty of this smartphone-based system is that your smartphone can be more sensitive than human eye. So the, uh, the pattern recognition-wise, experienced people can actually make a you know, clear distinction, but the smartphone can actually improve the resolution and then by increasing the exposure time and so on. So we actually hope that it will be way better than experienced botanists. So right now, the answer is no. Uh, between species, but um, I'm pretty sure we can actually tell the difference between virus or the other problems. Anybody else? Excellent, excellent. I, I'm very impressed. Thank you for Thank all you. those details and, and all the good work that, that everyone is doing here. Amazing. Um, First, I would say that uh, there's not many botanists or horticulturalists that can guarantee a virus detection by looking at the leaf. There, there are good people, mm -hmm. certainly, right, Stacey, that, that can give you an idea. They have to look at a lot more things. If you just walk in with a leaf, eh, it could be, could be. You know, you get a 50-50 mm -hmm. chance or, mm -hmm. or something. So please keep working on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's for sure. And um, I took some notes. I will be writing some things to you. Mm -hmm. One of them specifically was the word NASA. I think you need to introduce some of this technology through some of the um, grants that are available now with NASA. Actually, the, uh, one of my former master's students also uh, graduated from the biosystems engineering department. So his name is Zach Dean. But um, he did PhD in the BME here. And he's now working at NASA. And he is keep looking for, keep sending an email, Dr. Yen, do you have a cool idea that I can propose? <laughs> this might be it. And this may be it, but um, you know, I cannot do it by myself because I need a backup from the um, people like you, okay, who has an expertise in the um, plants and controlled environments. And uh, we need to actually, so basically the, he said that, um, you know, the, I can propose, but um, they don't really like it. They want to see the uh, complete team uh, that will guarantee success mm. because it's a federal money and they do not want failure. And then uh, how do you actually uh, guarantee failure? Well, when you have a 
expertise, you know, the um, making up, you know, the, these guys are doing on the plant stuff, and these guys are working on the environment, controlled environment, and these guys are working on the sensor, then uh, we can actually make a compelling proposal. Yeah. So that's what I'm very interested in pursuing. And this is very timely when I actually receive your the invitation. Then I was actually thinking about actually visiting you guys anyway. And then um, I thought it was really timely. Any more questions? Yes. Hi. Um, as a plant science student, this was really interesting and amazing. So thank you for doing this work. Um, with diagnostic PCR, you can do quality control and positive and negative controls when running samples. How would you account for something like that with this technology to make sure that everybody's camera can actually perform the task as well as keeping false negatives and false positives um, at bay? Well, you know, our method is not based on PCR. However, I know where it's coming from because um, I actually skipped this movie. I think you can see it. So um, we can also build a portable handheld PCR device. This is the, um, the little bit older version. This is the 2000, published in 2014, I believe. So you can see that this device can run from the gene extraction sample purification all the way down to detection, all done in a robotic arm manner, okay? And it's all controlled by the Arduino microcontroller. And there's a heating element, moving room element, and then um, basically everything is automated and it's really quick. Because um, we are not using stationary chamber, but your drop is keep moving around, so the heat transfer becomes from conduction to convection. You know, the heat transfer coefficient, you are a plant scientist, so probably never heard about it, but the engineers probably know what the difference in the heat transfer coefficient. Conduction is way, uh, convection is way faster. So we can actually finish this reaction from the sample to answer in 15 minutes. Whereas in the regular PCR, thermocycling itself is about 45 minutes. Sample preparation, uh, maybe another an hour. And um, gel electrophoresis and gel documentation, hour or plus. So all together about three hours, but this one is 15 minutes. So that's something that can be done in the, um, you know, the isolated environment. And um, the, actually the next version of it is this one. I need to actually show it to presentation mode. So these are the small devices. I don't ask me why I actually have four because um, the, this journal, there is a limitation I can upload. It cannot be any bigger than five megabytes or something. So I have to split into four. And um, so you can clearly see that the devices now become a lot smaller. And then uh, my detection device, detection device is smartphone still. And compared to smartphone, you can see how small the device is. And this one is now based on optical detection, but the uh, interfacial detection based method. And I was really proud of using smartphone and automated and then faster detection. I emphasized a lot about it. And um, you know, the editor didn't really, editor is not really interested because this is the, the science advances journal. So they care about the science. And then however, he really liked the interfacial tension component. And I think we got accepted because of the interfacial tension component. And this is actually compatible to, in performance-wise, compatible to benchtop PCR. It's pretty much the same, meaning you can actually make a clear distinction between virus species, and then you can theoretically run, you know, the, add the multiple primers, and then do the multi, multiplex amplification. And you can do cross-validation. And um, you can actually hang, you know, the apply like, Right now, the, uh, my student actually did three drops that are single assay, but you can easily increase up to nine. So you can actually run nine different assays at the same time. So this is something that can be used in, for example, you know, the spaceship or the um, lunar greenhouse and so on. But you know, however, I think the NASA people will be more interested in the smartphone or imaging-based technology rather than PCR because the PCR has been attempted and then they didn't really like it as far as I know unless we can come up with a much more simplified version of the PCR. Well, there is a lamp, but um, I don't want to talk about it today. That's a little, little too far, but that's more biology-oriented question. 
So in short, my smartphone cannot really make a distinction um, between the actual strains or the, the, of the viruses. But you know, who knows, maybe um, when you got a huge amount of the, you know, the data accumulated, it may be able to make a distinction based on the image analysis. And that I do not know. I frankly think it is possible, but I don't wanna say that because I have no backup data to make, my, make such claim. And then um, whenever I actually say something to the journalist, um, you know, when I say something or possible, make it as a fact, and I'm a little bit nervous about it. <laughs> so that's I'm not saying anything at this time, but definitely a possibility with the imaging-based method. Okay, I've got one from out on the internet somewhere. And do you see any opportunities for nutrient levels in leaves to oh, be yeah. assessed with this technology? Oh yeah, the, um, I actually the, um, the thought about the, I'm writing a proposal about that about more than 10 years ago. Because basically, the, when you have a hydroponic system, you really want to monitor the nutrient level so you can replenish as needed. Yes, it is possible. And then, um, yeah, all right, so we can write proposals together. And then there are many, you know, the, it's just some, you know, the titration or the colorimetric dieting. It's really easy, and then it's just a matter of you actually have an inline microfluidic system, and then taking out small amount of the liquid from your the main pipe and analyze that automatically. You don't have to pipette it, okay? You just need a solenoid valve to take the small amount of sample out, okay? So there is a strong there is uh, there is a possibility, and um, that can be easy, that can be relatively easily done. But I'm not saying easily means when I say easily then can I have the device tomorrow? No. <laughs> it takes time to make it happen. And then we had a question. Oh, okay. Uh, there's also a need for assessing how much nutrients is left in the fertigation solution when you're using the hydroponic system. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed you've got some spectrographic analysis. Is there any way to- Oh, converting smartphone, smartphone into a spectrometer. Yeah, or gas chromatograph maybe. Spectrometer, it is possible. Your smartphone can only see two different colors. To make a spectrum, you need to, you know, your resolution should be in the nanometer, uh, nanometer scale. So you have to have, um, you know, the, uh, the, however, you know, the, uh, I can actually make it happen. Um, okay, where is it? I think, oh, this is one. This is actually the Raspberry Pi device, but we can translate it to the, um, the smartphone very easily. So there is a cubet there, and then we have a white light, light uh, the LED light source, and then um, it just uh, hits the deflector meter, uh, diffraction grating, and then create this beautiful rainbow, okay? And, um, and then it's actually, it's same principle as the, the spectrometer, and then uh, we can convert this, you know, the smartphone as a spectrometer detector. So this is demonstrated on Raspberry Pi, but I don't see the reason why not. It can be translated to a smartphone. And then we can do spectral analysis. We can do fluorescence detection, spectral analysis, whatever. There may be a way to head off the nutrient deficiencies in the leaves yes. before it even happens. Exactly. So we can do that. We can have both, actually. The chlorophyll, the plant water stress monitor, as well as the nutrient analysis spectrometer base. We have a two smartphone system, or maybe Raspberry Pi, because you don't want to. This is like a more like an online monitoring system. And in that case, I don't want to put $1,000 smartphone in the, in the inline system, someone actually can steal it. So it's gonna be Raspberry Pi in that case, in Pi camera. John Yul, mm -hmm. very nice, very exciting work. Congratulations again to you and your team mm -hmm. um, sitting back there. Um, I totally agree with you. I think the, the main challenge so far has been understanding the signal mm -hmm. and then what that signal is representing, mm -hmm. you know, where that sense, sense, stress is coming from. Mm -hmm. um, I totally agree with you in terms of machine learning now mm -hmm. being really a critical tool here to analyze those signals mm -hmm. because uh, we see NDVI, we see other crop indices, mm -hmm. they mean something, but mm -hmm. uh, how do you differentiate that? So I uh, totally agree on that. I want to ask you in terms of, you know, you working with smart sensors, detecting various things, mm -hmm. and in this case with plant, uh, you know, health monitoring, um, where do you see the main challenges when, you, when we take it to an outdoor environment, let's say in a, um, 
in a real world setting under natural sunlight or maybe under supplemental lighting because this is where we see you know working with other types of mission vision mm -hmm. systems that the environment is it really a huge disturbance mm -hmm. um i haven't worked with smartphones but i would like to uh, okay. just see where what do you think about well, that's why we are measuring NDVI yeah. because you use NIR as a reference and then normalize them. So the, um, the ambient lighting difference or the uh, different sunlighting and direction shouldn't really matter. The, um, the real challenge is we showed a lot of our images, right? And then we did the uh, elliptical crop and then we just analyzed it. And um, the real challenge is that uh, how are we gonna recognize the shape of the, so we did actually manually but somehow your app must be able to recognize the leaf shape, leaf shape automatically, okay? I'm referring more to like shadows and saturation and reflectance. So as long as the, um, all the leaves are completely in the shadow or completely on the sunlight, I don't think there'll be any problem because the NDVI, we, the normalization can actually take care of that. The real challenge is what if your leaves are actually half in the shade and half under the sunlight? But you know, again, we can actually address that using our app. You know, the app is really, you can actually do the um, histogram analysis and these are under the sun. You can easily figure out these are under the sun and these are under the shade. We can just filter them out. But you know, I'm not saying it can be done r next day. You need to actually code it. But there are ways to eliminate those shading effects. In fact, you know, the um, addressing those shading in the imaging has been a long standing topic for electronic and electrical engineers and then the uh, optics people. Mm. It's not something our invention, we just need to learn from someone else and then introduce to our technology. Yeah. Do you also, are you also considering adding uh, the thermal uh, imaging because those are becoming really cheap now with smartphones and the signal for, from, from plants temperature is much faster to stress than you know, seeing it with the reflectance with others. Yes, yeah. I do have Plio camera and uh, attachable to iPhone 5S, but that was a long time ago. And then uh, at the time I paid $600. And it's actually, the iPhone 5S at the time was actually about 500. So the, uh, my Flio camera was more expensive than my iPhone. And uh, do we still have it? Or is it kind of lost? We have it, but you know, how can you use iPhone 5S? <laughs> <laughs> and then it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, of course. And then, I'm pretty sure there is a Raspberry Pi, for Pi, the camera for the Raspberry Pi that can measure the IR thermal imaging. Yes, so the, uh, right now, not really adaptable to the smartphone because we need to attach something, but the better solution is the Raspberry Pi. Yes, it is possible. And then it can directly tell you the um, actual water content in your sample. Any more? If not, thank you again. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.